Thank you for coming. This is All the Ways to Build a Website. Uh, these slides are at alltheways.website, so you can go back there whenever you want to take a look at these. This is a talk I first gave at Nerd Summit in 2020, and I haven't updated it much, so a lot of the stats are from two years ago, but it doesn't matter too much because it's mainly an overview kind of, uh, kind of talk. All right, so here we go. So I am Rick Hood. I am a Drupal developer in, at Common Media since 2011. We're out in Western Mass. I live in Amherst, Mass. Um, I'm also an organizer of the Nerd Summit, which is a development conference out here in Western Mass. You, you usually hold it at UMass, but COVID's been a bit of a problem lately. Um, also an organizer at uh, New England Drupal Camp. Uh, in a previous life, meaning before 2000, I was in the boat business. And partly because of that, I do this uh, Yacht and Sutter's Guide, but that's been kind of dead for two years because of COVID. And then I've been getting back into music since 2020, like a lot of people have. And if you want to listen to my stuff, it's at SoundCloud slash float. All right, so why this talk? Um, I do Drupal all day long at Common Media, and I've been doing that since like 2007 or so. But uh, while I love Drupal, um, I've heard so much about React and all this other stuff going on in the JavaScript world that about three three years ago, maybe, I sort of wanted to just dive in and try to learn more about it just for the heck of it. So I like took a couple of West Boss courses, a couple of Scott Talinsky courses. If you don't know them, uh, listen to the syntax.fm podcast because they do that podcast. And it's basically, it's one of the best podcasts out there for JavaScript or, or for web development in general. But uh, anyways, they, they both have courses on React and all kinds of other stuff like Node. So I dove into it and now I know just enough to be dangerous. <laughs> so I'm gonna tell you what I know here. Um, so this talk is in uh, three parts. One is sort of a history, how did we get here? Another, and then the next part is where are we now, which is basically what happened in the last decade or so. And then finally uh, demos of, of where are we now? All right, history, how did we get here? Um, this is the brief history of the first two decades of the web. So in 1990, almost 32 years ago now, uh, the first web browser came out. Tim Berners-Lee did that. He also did HTML. That came out also in 1990. Um, in 93, this thing called CGI came out, which I believe is the first time that websites could interact and do you know, executing programs and stuff and talk to databases. Um, so that was a big step forward. And Perl came out in 94, which was for quite a while Perl was kind of the language you used to write, write, write websites that actually did things like talk to database and did transactions and stuff. Um, then PHP came out in 95. Um, that's used on almost 80% of websites today, the websites that use server-side programming. Um, JavaScript came out in 95. That's used on like 95% of websites, uh, front end, you know, and back end. MySQL came out in 95. That's a database if you don't know. Active server pages, which is another technology for talking to databases and stuff, uh, came out in 96. That's what I started with. Um, CSS came out in 96. Flash came out in 96. I did a lot of Flash stuff back in the day. I used to love Flash, but uh, no more. Um, and then there were other ones that came out like Python, of course, Java, Cold Fusion, Ruby, the language, but not Rails yet, Erlang, the language, Scala, bunch of, so a whole bunch came out during the, during that period. Um, and then web servers, Apache came out in 95, Nginx came out in 2004, Microsoft in, what is it, Internet Information Server or something, I forget what I, I, IIS stands for, but that's 1995. Etc. So they they came out during that period, and then a whole bunch of code editors came out from Emacs to Front Page, <laughs> to uh, Visual Basic, to Dreamweaver, to I'm using Visual Studio Code nowadays. Um, so this is kind of when all these code editors came out. And then in the next decade, for 2000 a lot of tools came out that use those basic technologies. So WordPress came out in 2003, Joomla 2005, um, Shopify, Drupal 2000, Squarespace, Wix, Blogger, and tons of others. So that decade seemed to be the one of 
tools that um, use basic technologies. So yeah, I'm gonna summarize here. So the 90s seemed to be a period where all this basic web technology happened. It's really amazing when you look at everything that happened in the 90s, all this really basic stuff like you know, MySQL and other databases, JavaScript, PHP, just amazing period there of all this basic web technology stuff coming up. And then the next decade was when tools that use these technologies sort of exploded, including Rails for Ruby, um, WordPress and Drupal use PHP, I think Blogger use PHP, et cetera. So what, what's next? What happened in the next decade? Well, there was kind of an explosion that happened. But first, a little detour, which also gets into the history of stuff. Um, this was my path. So like I said, my first career was in boats, which was pre-2000. But somewhere around 96 or 97, this guy at work said, hey, come on, I want you to come and visit a friend of mine. Come with me to visit a friend of mine in Newport named Mark Bisline. And he was working out of his home office doing interactive tours of private schools on DVDs. So that was when DVDs were still a thing. And you would like put a DVD in your computer and you'd click around and take a tour or something like that. And sort of the program for doing that those days was Macromedia Director. Macromedia is the one that was that invented Flash later on. So Macromedia Director. And I just remember walking out of there saying to my friend who took me there, I want to be doing that someday. So I got Macromedia and tried to learn it. Uh, I'm sorry, Macromedia Director and tried to learn it and uh, quickly learned that you had to have stuff to put in it like imagery. So I fell in love with Photoshop when I got that and learned that. And, but then pretty soon, oh, another th interesting thing before I go on about Mark is that he later founded a, a company called schoolyard.com. So he pivoted into the web from doing DVDs and he ended up do using Drupal to build many, many sites for schools because schoolyard.com focused on building websites for school. So it's kind of a coincidence that he ended up in Drupal too. Uh, anyways, uh, so I came out thinking I really want to do this. And then pretty soon after that, Flash came out. And Flash could more or less do what Director could do, except it did it on the web. So for quite a while, I was using Flash. And I was using Active Server Pages. And I was doing everything in Dreamweaver. So Dreamweaver, Active Server Pages, and Flash. And I was doing that for quite a while. So in 2000, we sold the boat business and I took a left turn and went to website development. It was really half graphic design and half website development. And um, and then up and then around 2007 or so, I don't really remember why or how, but I shifted into Drupal. I shifted both into Drupal and into PHP at the same time. Um, so I did that and I've been just doing Drupal ever since. And then fast forward to, you know, basically three, three or four years ago, I started looking into other things, but I still do Drupal all day long. And I've never really built a production site that uses, you know, React or anything like that, but I've just done a lot of playing around with it. So that's, that's enough of the side thing here. Okay, so this, what happened in the past decade, I think, I think five things happened. I'd be interested to hear from those that are more knowledgeable than me, but it seems like this is what happened. First of all, JavaScript frameworks and libraries exploded. Um, the decoupling of front end from back end, which is sometimes called headless, happened. Mm -hmm. Then because of that, there were many new options for the back end as API. Um, and then static site generators became a thing. And I'm gonna talk about all of these, so don't worry if you don't know what this means. And then also easy ways to deploy, build and host sites happen. So I think those five things happened in the last decade that really made a huge change in the industry. So in 2009, Node came out and Node is a way to run JavaScript on a server. So that changed a lot of stuff. And I don't know how related it is, but then a whole bunch of front end JavaScript uh, things came out, React maybe being the most famous one, but plenty of others like Ember, Angular, Express, Vue.js, and tons of others came out. So JavaScript exploded. Um, and the headless thing means basically that a website can serve data instead of serving a website. So often that data is JSON, but it could be XML or something else. But nowadays it's usually JSON. So a website can serve JSON and interact with JavaScript on the front end. And I'll get into that more. So that kind of exploded. 
then tons of options for the CMS's back end. So instead of just having a CMS like Drupal or WordPress that, that does a word that does a whole website, <clears throat> you could use that just to provide the JSON, just to provide the data. So that became a big thing. And in all these services you're looking at here, some of them just do that. They don't do front end, they just do back end. Static site generators. Um, let me see if there was something to look. Oh yeah, I wanted, let me go here. So this is a, a list of all the different headless CMSs. So you can you can wander through that when you get a chance. And then static site generators, Jekyll, Hugo, Levendy, Next.js, Nux, Gatsby, many others. Um, static site generators means that it generates this generates the site on the server and then basically just serves HTML, CSS, and Javas front end JavaScript, not back end JavaScript. So it's kind of all pre-made. Um, it doesn't have to make calls to the database because it's already done that and built the site. And again, you can look at all the many <clears throat> tons of static site generators that are around. And next, uh, so deploy, build, and host. You had all kinds of services come out, Heroku, GitHub Pages, Platform SH, Firebase, Net 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 Netlify is a huge one and really popular, GitLab, Zite, tons of others um, are out there. So many ways to easily deploy, build, and host a website. So that's number five. So altogether now, JavaScript frameworks exploded, headless API exploded, backend only CPS exploded, static site generators and deploy, build and hosting. All of that stuff happened in the last decade. So here's one example, first example. So if you start on the right-hand side, the data is being stored in a MySQL database, which is what WordPress commonly uses. And then the CMS used here is WordPress. And then it's, you could stop right there and WordPress could be the website. But what's happened over the last um, decade is that instead you could serve JSON and then in this, as the data, and then this example, the JSON gets sucked into Gatsby. Gatsby uses GraphQL, which is that pink or that pinkish logo. And then the React is the blue logo. So that Gatsby combines both of those things to create a server side rendered site, which is basically a type of static site generator. So SSR means server side rendered. CSR means client side rendered, which I'll get into later, but Gatsby is a server side rendering thing. So in this example, WordPress is your backend that's serving JSON that goes into Gatsby that spits out HTML, CSS, and JavaScript as your hosted static files. So that's, that's that example. Um, this is just showing that Netlify can do the, all of that for you. So Netlify can do the Gatsby and everything else in the rendering um, and it can hook up to, uh, to a WordPress site or any, any kind of JSON data. Um, so this is just an example showing that you can pull more than one set of data into the same Gatsby. So you could have a Shopify site that has products and a WordPress site that has other stuff. And both of them serves JSON that goes into Gatsby that spits out your website. This is... This is um, showing that you've got many, many options for the back end, which I kind of already showed before, but this is just showing it in a different way. Um, and if you start at the right-hand column, you can see there's all these different options for storing the data. There's the usual MySQL, MariaDB, Postgres um, databases. Those are sort of the typical standard databases, but then you've got markdown files. That's, that's what this M logo is. And that's what, for example, Grav and Curvy and Forestry, they use Markdown files to store data in. Um, Prismic and Sanity use GraphQL to store data in. Contentful um, uses Neo 4J, whatever that is, <laughs> to store uh, their data in. And then the CMS itself there are all these services I just mentioned, like Shopify, WordPress, Drupal, Joomla, Django, whatever you want to use. And as long as it can spit out data as JSON, something else over here on the left can... Uh, can serve it, can create the website from it. Um, so this one slide is kind of my whole talk in one slide where it's got a lot of what you already saw on the previous slide, but in the, let's see, where should I start here? If I go in the lower left here, many other SSG, S, 
static site generator, server-side rendered options. You could just use Next and React instead of Gatsby. You could use Nuxt with Vue instead of Gatsby. You could use 11D Hugo or Jekyll instead of Gatsby. So you could use all these other options uh, because I use Gatsby as my main um, example, but there are many other ways to do something similar. Or you can do straight up client side rendering. And that is when you bypass the whole server side rendered thing and the JSON goes directly to your client. So for example, um, well, you, you could use this WordPress example with a JSON from WordPress is getting picked up by React or something. Let's say it's React, but it could be a React. It's client side React. It's grabbing that JSON data and building the HTML in the browser. Um, so, but other examples I'm showing here, you could have a Firebase um, you could have your data in Firebase, and that could connect with React on the front end and build your website that way. Um, Vue.js is another thing to use instead of React on the front end. Um, so that's client-side rendered as opposed to server-side rendered. Um, and then there's do-it-yourself, you know, software as a service options like Squarespace and Wix. So they, they should be mentioned because they're out there and they came along in the last decade or so. So this is just showing, um, you know, all the options there are now. Whereas before the last decade, you had WordPress, Drupal, Joomla, Django. You probably had Shopify, but you didn't have all this other stuff, and you didn't have all this front-end rendering stuff like React, Vue, and all of that jazz. So, so that's the kind of world that that I kind of discovered when I started looking into. Really, I was just planning on looking into React, but I found all this other stuff that seemed pretty amazing. All right, so how to, so now we're into the demo part. Uh, these are all videos. Um, so I'm going to take you through demos about how some of this stuff works, just as examples. Squarespace is one, GitHub pages, Alemity, San, Sanity, and Netlify, React, and Firebase, and Netlify, and Gatsby. So first one is Squarespace. Um, so I'm going to see if you can hear this here. Um, let me know if you can't hear it. Could you hear that? No, I don't think it doesn't seem like we can hear. I think you might have to do the, okay. the video share. Sorry. No problem. Okay, I'm going to. Boy, I need to find. I'm looking for the menu. For the link? Yeah, the menu to, no, I got the link to the. Okay. Oh, there it is. I mean, I'm sorry, I need to get it back over here. Okay, dot, dot, dot. Share video. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's take a quick look at how how to build a site with Squarespace. You've all seen Squarespace. Did you hear that okay? Yeah, that's great. great. Uh, awesome, okay. Squarespace before, if you've seen the Super Bowl ads or whatever, um, I'm logged into my Squarespace account. I just have one Squarespace site for the Amherst Education Foundation. We'll take a look at that in a bit. But to create a new site, you just click this Create a Site button. It brings you to a bunch of templates first. It wants you to pick a template first. So I'm just going to pick this first one I find here. And I'm not going to change any defaults. I'm just going to do this real fast. So I just do Next, Next, Get Started. And there's my site. now. I can now edit this site, but I'm not going to edit this site. I'm going to go edit my Amherst Education Foundation site. But if I go into Settings and if I go into Domains, I can see the domain that I can get to this site, the, the actual uh, published site. So I'm going to copy this. Copy. There should be an easier way to get to it, but I can't figure out what it is. So if I paste that in there, there's that site that I just built. Okay, so that's how fast it is to, to build a site. Uh, so now I'm going to go back to my dashboard and I'm going to go into Amherst Education Foundation because I know this one better. And 
if you go to the pages section you can choose any page to edit but I'm just gonna I'll just stick in the home page and the way Squarespace works is as you hover over things you can you find these this admin bar here so if I click edit here and then I go inside here these little widgets pop up see these things popping up and if you click on it if I click in here for example I can add any kind of widget so I could add more text I could add an image I could add a video um, a gallery so all kinds of different things you can add inside your page so that's basically the way Squarespace works there's not that much to it I don't want to spend too much time on this because it's pretty self-explanatory um, it's pretty self-explanatory how to create new pages um, the when you build a site it comes with comes with certain um, you know default sample pages so you can mess around with those but uh, I just encourage you just to get a Squarespace account and try messing around with it. It's like I said, it's all pretty self-explanatory. Okay, that's enough on Squarespace. Okay, so now we'll go to the next one. Uh, so I just say here that Squarespace is pretty simple, um, but you can do a lot with it. There's a lot of big sites that use Squarespace, so like Mark Marin's W2F. TF podcast uses it. Um, so go take a look at that. It's a pretty nice website. All right, next is GitHub pages. Um, so I'm going to grab this one. Okay, let's see. You need to stop screen share before. Oh, I see. Okay. So let's start with what's probably one of the super simplest way to deploy a website. On my GitHub account, I've created a repo called Sample GitHub Pages, and the only thing in it is a README file and an index.html file. And then what I did was I went over to settings <clears throat> and I scrolled down to the GitHub pages section and I chose the source that I want to this GitHub pages site to use and I did not choose a theme. And when I saved that master branch, it created the site here. So if I click on here, you can see the super simple index.html file there. So this is couldn't be easier really uh, and couldn't be simpler because I just have one file up there but you can imagine you could have CSS files JavaScript files whatever you want so if you're just creating a real simple site this is one super simple way to do it um, of course I've downloaded that to my um, local and that's where I did the work of adding the HTML file and committing that and pushing it up um, the other thing to mention is that you can connect custom domains to this, to this, so you don't have to have this URL. You can have whatever domain you want. So that's it. That's a super simple way to publish a simple website with GitHub pages. Okay, let's go to the next one. Let's see, I think I have to stop this one. Okay. So that's GitHub pages. Um, you just have to have a GitHub account. You, when you push your change, if you don't know how to use Git or whatever, that's a whole another story. But if you push your Git changes up to GitHub, it just publishes the new site automatically. Um, it's free. It's ridiculous. Um, you can connect a domain to it for free. It's got SSL for free. Um, so the Nerd Summit website uses that, for example, and it's just really nice. Is it only free if it's public? Uh, no, the, the the repo does not have to be public, if that's what you mean. It can be a private repo. Um, so it's just free, period, I guess. 
I don't, there must, there's got to be limits to, you know, how much traffic it can have, but I don't remember what they are. And, and Rick, I don't know if you're going to talk on GitLab pages separately, but I know those services are similar. Um, and GitLab pages has access control and things like that built in too. It seems to have a little more features for something that's very similar. Oh, that sounds good. All right, so the next example is going to be a Lavendi using Sanity as the back end and using Netlify as the way to deploy everything. So I'm going to grab, okay, and then back here, let's see, another year. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, let's take a look at making a blog with the 11T static site generator in the Sanity backend, all hosted on Netlify. Okay, here I am at sanity.io. I'll log in. It's going to remember me. So it takes me here. You see I've done a couple of projects here, blog with Gatsby and blog with 11T. Um, if you want to create a new project, you can click this, and it will give you some instructions on how to do it on your local and your terminal. But if you go to Get Started, and then you go over here with to starter projects and then see all starter projects this is where i went to create uh the thing i'm going to show you also i blog with gatsby i created from here portfolio with gatsby a whole bunch of other ones Next.js, events with Nuxt.js, and then this blog with 11t is the one i'm going to show you so that i created what i'm going to show you by clicking this so let's go back to where i was and i'm going to click into my blog with 11t project. So up here is the link to the actual Sanity backend. So I'm going to click on that. And here I am at the Sanity backend for this thing. And up at the top, it gives you some help videos. If you scroll down a little bit, it shows you here Sanity Studio and your blog website. So both Sanity itself and the blog are both hosted on Netlify. So Sanity doesn't have, to my knowledge, its own place to host things. It partners with Netlify. So when you create a Sanity backend, it hosts it on Netlify. And also the blog that we're going to look at with 11T is hosted on Netlify. Scroll down here, it gives me some other project information. And then over here, it shows my recent blog post. So let's make a new blog post. I'm going to go into here and then I'm going to click plus blog post. Uh, I'll just do something really simple just to do it fast. The slug is going to be the path. One thing I notice if you don't select a date here, it won't publish it. So I'm not going to do an image or anything just to make it fast. And I'll just put test here. All right, I'm going to click publish. <clears throat> okay, it says it's published. Let's go back to settings. I'm sorry, let's go back to blog with 11T. So although it says it's published, it's not going to show up on the website. So let's click view here to actually look at the website. So nothing to look at, but this is what the 11T, 11T um, blog looks like. And if I go back here, and you can see that I don't see that new test one. So what I have to do is deploy. So I click deploy here. And now it's going to build on Netlify, the, the new build of the Netlify site. I mean, sorry, of the 11T site. So this is going to take a while to build, so I'm going to stop the video and come back. Okay, I'm back, and you can see the build was successful. So if we go over to the blog again, we should see that test. Yep, there's the test. Um, all right, so that's how you use, that's how you edit content using Sanity and 11T. Um, let's go back. So Sanity uses GraphQL. That's what this pink logo is for its back end. And the setup with 11D is that it's querying GraphQL for the data and then doing its build process to create the blog post itself. Um, so I'm going to go into the code a little bit just to show you some stuff. This is the this is the repo for what you were just looking at. There's a studio folder. There's a web folder. The studio is obviously for the Sanity Studio part and the web folders for the 11 d part. Um, I'm really just going to briefly show you some things here. So you can see that it uses Nunjux um, templating language. So you can see here that this is the template for a post. 
where you've got the post title, you've got the post body, etc. And then you've got some front matter up here, which is similar to what you can do with markdown files. Um, and this is telling it to use this layout. There's the base layout. So it's using this as the base layout and then using this as the data, you know, telling you what data to get. Um, and that's all in the includes folder. When it does its build thing, it gets built into the site folder, which does not get committed to the repo. That gets built up on Netlify. So there's way more to talk about here, but I just wanted to briefly show you what the structure of the code looks like. Okay, that's that one. Now I gotta stop sharing, I think. Okay. All right, so next. So 11D, blah, blah, blah. So take a look at 11D if you wanna know more. Um, any questions while um, at this point or you okay? Still good? All right, sounds like you're still good. So next uh, example is, um, let me just make sure my, yeah. Okay, next example is Firebase and React. So let me grab the video there. Um, let's see. Okay, share video. Okay, here we go. Okay, let's take a look at React and Firebase working together. This is going to be a client-side rendered app rendering the React in your browser, not on the server. And Firebase is a very fast database service that uses WebSockets, so the changes you see are immediate. Um, and it's going to be hosted on Netlify. So what we're going to be looking at is what gets built in this course, React for Beginners by Wes Boss, and he creates this fish market catch of the day, fish market app in React. And this is what it looks like up, hosted up on Netlify. Um, you can see how you can add things to your order, etc. cetera. Um, and then over here is the inventory control. I'm logged into the app, so that's why I can see this inventory control. Um, I'll just simply show you that it's hosted on Netlify here. In this case, Netlify is not doing any kind of a build process or anything like that. All it's doing is hosting the, the files. So it's just, that's all it's doing. And the way I deployed it is I did not connect it to the Git repo. I simply used the Netlify command line interface in my local computer. And it's just a command that's Netlify deploy that you can just push it up to this particular um, instance on Netlify. So it's going to connect to Firebase. Here's the Firebase site, firebase.google.com. I'm already logged in, so if I click go to console, I'll see what, what I have going on up here at Firebase. And I have two things, some kind of test I was doing. And then here's the catch of the day one. So if I click on that, there's various uh, things over on the left-hand side. I'm not going to go over authentication here, but that is how when you take that course, that is how authentication works um, on the fish market to log in to be able to change the inventory. But if I click on the database settings, I'm going to see this. Now, the reason why it's got this funny name here is that the way he sets up the course is that when you first go to the site, it asks you to pick a it asks you to pick a store and it automatically creates a random store name. So that's why that funny name is there. But I'm not going to create a new store. I already have this store. So I'm going to pop that open and you can see the fishes here. So fish one, fish two, fish one is Atlantic Calibut, fish two is lobster, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the inventory. Um, now what I'm going to do is open two browser windows to show you how quickly this works. So in the left hand, I've got that app open. Uh, and on the right hand, I've got uh, Firebase open. Now watch the name over in Firebase Atlantic Halibut as I change it on the website to Pacific. See how quickly that changed in the database? So that's how, how fast this stuff works. Um, the other thing I want to show you too is that if I add to order, 
and I change it back to Atlantic, it changes in all three places that it shows in the app, which is which is one thing that's cool about um, about React, right? And it also changed it up in the database. So I can show you how I can go the other way where I can do it from the database. And it changed it in the app in all three places that it's being used. So that's, like I said, a very dynamic type of site, all client side rendered, not server side rendered, um, not, not a static site at all, a very dynamic site. And I'm just going to briefly show you the code involved. And it's going to have to be brief because it's way too much to go into what, what this, all this app does. But it's got the usual React SRC folder with components folder. One file you need to do is create this base.js file where you import rebase from rebase, import Firebase from Firebase. And then it just needs an API key. It needs the authorization domain. And it needs the database URL. So it just needs those three things, and then you, um, then you create your, your base component, and then you export Firebase app and export default base, and then they get used over in your app. So this is the main component, app.js, and um, it gets used in this section here, component did mount. And this is the code that's actually syncing the local state of the React app to the Firebase database. So that's, that's the code that's doing that. And again, it's way too much to go into all of this, but I just wanted to briefly you know, show you where the code is that connects to Firebase. So I think that's it. Um, I would just recommend going, to, going into Firebase and seeing all that it can do. Get yourself a Firebase account and just play around with it. It's pretty neat. All right, that's it. Okay, let me stop that one. And yep, so there's more here, React for Beginners, Firebase, getting started with React and Firebase. So there's a bunch of links here, and later on I'm going to show you some others to go learn more about this stuff. Okay, finally, uh, last example is Gatsby with connected to Drupal using Netlify for hosting Gatsby and Pantheon for hosting the Drupal site. All right. Let's see. Okay, let's take a look at Gatsby plus Drupal, one of the many ways to build a website these days. So what I'm showing you here is what was basically built in a Gatsby training I took at New England Drupal Camp with Shane Thomas in October. And there's a link here to see Shane's videos on how to do Gatsby, which are quite good. So here, the Gatsby front end is going to be hosted on Netlify. That's a service that's really great. Um, and the Drupal site is going to be hosted on Pantheon. Uh, it would be an all-day course to show you how, the details of how to set all this stuff up, but this whole talk is to give you a taste of what can be done. So that's what we're going to do here. So here's my Drupal site up on Pantheon, and I'm showing you a view of articles. I've got three articles here, Peacock A, Peacock B. Peacock C. This, uh, I don't need to do anything more than this. This could be my website. I don't need Gatsby, but if I wanted to leverage the power of Gatsby, I might want to connect this to Gatsby. So that's what I'm doing here. Um, here I'm just showing you the Pantheon dashboard if you haven't seen it before, and I'm just using the development site. I don't need the test or live site. Um, you can get a few free sites on, on uh, Pantheon and just use the development uh, version for playing around with the site. If I click this link here, it will take me to the development site. I just want to show you a couple more things in, in the Drupal side. One is that Drupal has a module called JSON API. And if you simply enable that module, Drupal will spit out all the data for the Drupal site at this path JSON API. So that's kind of all you need to do on Drupal to get it to work with Gatsby. You just need to provide this JSON data to Gatsby. So let's go over to the Gatsby side of things. This is the Gatsby side of my local host. You can see Peacock A, B, and C. It looks a little bit like the view on the Drupal side. If I click one of these, I go to Peacock A, etc. 
So that's on my local site. And then this is up on Netlify. And same deal there. So this is the Gatsby site, pulling the data from the Drupal site. Um, now, how does that happen? How does that all connect together? One of the great things about Gatsby is it's got a whole bunch of different plugins. So in this case, I'm using Gatsby source Drupal plugin, and it makes it dead simple to connect a Gatsby site to a Drupal site. You install the, uh, this plugin, and then you simply put this into your Gatsby config file. I'm going to show you that in a second. Um, so in Gatsby config, you have these, these uh, plugins, and this is the plugin for Gatsby source Drupal. You give it a URL to the, to the Drupal site, and you can give it a path, but it defaults to the JSON API path if you don't give it a path. So let's look at the code. <clears throat> Uh, this is the only code I'll show you for, uh, you know, for this video. And here you can see the Gatsby source Drupal plugin. And I've added one thing, which is basic authentication. So in order, I hide my site with user and pass, and I provide that here. You can stick the user and pass for this into Netlify. So that's where Netlify is getting the information. Okay, let's go over to the Netlify side. Here's my Netlify account where I've been playing around with different things. Um, and then this site here is, is the one we're talking about. So when I click on that and click there, it brings me to the site. And then here's my articles. Now what I want to show you, how, what I want to show you but not actually do is how easy it is to set up a site on Netlify. So you click this new site from Git button over here. You say where your, your repo is located. Mine's on GitHub. When I click that, I authorized Netlify to see two repos. One is this Pro Gatsby 2 repo, which is a course I took, uh, a Level Up Toots course. And then this one here, Gatsby Drupal, is the one that uh, is for this site. So if I click on that, and if I were to continue this, it would just deploy the site that you've, that you've already seen. Um, I think I can deploy more than one site from a repo, but I won't do that. But I just want to show you, really this is just to show you how easy it is to deploy something to Netlify. So that's that. All right, that's the last demo. Let's see what we got left here. So I already pretty much explained this. Uh, that was Gatsby on Netlify. Drupal on Pantheon, et cetera. Um, I guess here I'm also showing that, you know, you could have had your Drupal site on Acquia, Bluehost, Linode, wherever. It didn't, didn't have to be on Pantheon. And then on the right, you could have had it on Heroku or many other places besides Netlify. So I just wanted to make it clear that you could have those anywhere. But I just used Pantheon and Netlify in this example. Um, okay, so... The end, now what? So here's a whole bunch of resources about how to learn about React, Gatsby, Netlify, Sanity, GitHub pages, Firebase, Squarespace, blah, 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 blah. Oh, and the Jamstack bus meetup. <laughs> um, Node, uh, GraphQL, and a, so a whole bunch of links there. So hopefully that's helpful. Um, so let's see. Were you seeing that okay? Were you seeing my screen? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. All right. I guess that's it. Cool. Um, Rick, can we open it up for some questions? Absolutely. Folks? Yeah, go for okay. it. If you want, you can, at the bottom, you should be able to turn off your um, screen share because we're just seeing our own faces here now through your oh, screen. Oh, got it. Okay. But, um, yeah, I, I thought uh, this was really great. I'll, I'll start with a uh, question. Um, so it's cool. You've been in the web space for a long time, Rick. You've, you've seen kind of a progression of, you know, starting back with some ASP, Dreamweaver, Flash, and kind of progressing to uh, where you're doing Drupal in your day job. Do you, do you see some of this stuff that you're talking about in terms of React or Next or GraphQL or, or whatever it may be? Is that the next progression to what you're doing now? Or is it more of a complement to what you're doing now? Or is it, are these things fads? Like where, where do you see these fitting in the landscape of like your progression of how you've seen these things go throughout the years? 
I, I don't think it's a fad for sure, but I do think that many websites do not need this. <laughs> like, yeah. or wait, they don't need they don't need the React stuff. You know the fish market example. Most mm -hmm. websites we build don't need that kind of reactivity. Um, but but I will say that there's one heck of a lot simpler way to build a website than with Drupal. So like like with um, GitHub Pages, for example. So like we we run into clients that. Um, like the most painful thing is these upgrades from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8, for example, mm -hmm. the clients just, many clients just don't have the money for this. Like it's a lot of money to upgrade and so I feel bad for them, you know, cause it's just so much to do so much work. Um, so for smaller clients that just don't need all that stuff, um, you know, it could be anything from Squarespace to GitHub pages to whatever to, and you you know more about the static site generators that would be, you know that would be good to use there. But there's a lot cheaper, simpler way to build websites besides Drupal and, and even WordPress. You know, um, particularly from the hosting and the upgrade side of things. Um, so so that that I think is is a good thing. Um, and React is a good thing too. It's just that I don't think there. Are, we've really never built a site that really needed that kind of. Re reactivity you know yep but one I thing mean, to, one thing to know about that though is you do not have to build a whole react site like you could have a little block in your site be react like maybe you need like some little widget on your site to be very reactive like that fish market was you could build just that because you can attach react to, to a div on a page and and so it doesn't have to be your whole site that's react yeah do you ever run into any, so I mean, um, doing that approach where you're kind of client side rendering and even that approach where you had the, the Firebase site, mm -hmm. um, since it doesn't have, you know, like HTML fallbacks or like server side rendered HTML, do you have any troubles with like Google indexing these things for SEO or accessibility or those type of considerations when a, a machine's reading your website? Yeah, I hear that's a problem. Um, I don't know much. I. I, I don't know much about it other than I've heard that's a problem. Um, but there are apparently solutions that have come along for that. But I think if it's strictly client side rendered, um, let me think. Yeah, I just don't know enough about that. I know it's a problem, but I think it's somehow getting better, either because Google's getting better at indexing those sites or React is getting better at telling Google what's going on. And I'm using React as an, an example. It could be view or any of these any of these frameworks yeah i have other questions but do other folks have questions before i ask more Let's see some comments well i'm not sure what my question is but if i could feel it out a little bit um like i know that there's lots of options like this it is amazing but what about a best practice for um, a small company that needs a brochure site compared to the next level up where they need more secure database for e-commerce, e um, memberships, stuff like that. But if, if you could talk to that a little bit, it would help to know when the uh, use case for each of those um, tools you presented. My two cents is if you just need a brochure site, you just use WordPress or I mean, just use um, Squarespace or Wix or something like that, because it's dirt cheap. You don't have to worry about upgrades. It'll probably do everything you need to do. Um, I guess the next step up from that might be a WordPress.com site, because that's all hosted WordPress, as opposed to you having to figure out where to host it. So that would be a step up. But there, I, I imagine you're somewhat limited to what you can do in the WordPress site, but probably those limitations are fine. And then, then the, the craziest thing would be to build a custom, you know, React, whatever site. Um, probably the, cra well, I don't say craziest, but the most complicated, I think, would be something like Drupal as a back end doing the JSON and a React front end. Because for one thing, you got to host it in two different places. You got to worry about that um and it's just and you have to have developers and no drupal and developers and no react so you don't it's, you know it's a lot it's a lot to do that 
Yeah, I was also thinking of cases where um, they need marketing. Um, so there's um, the enterprise systems with um, running campaigns and doing lead generation. And then there's you know, tools that have them built in. And then I think because some organizations are understaffed, um, it seems like a good deal to get those not knowing that, you know, humans need to read um need to set them up um but then you know it's just a, a budget issue that they may spend so much money on the tool thinking it's going to be easier but it really eats up a budget anyways um i just wondered if anybody had any thoughts i think that's a good a point like so i i struggle with those thoughts too like the the, the proprietary platforms that do a lot for you so um, a lot of them, I won't, I don't want to name names of companies, but one of those full, you know, inbound marketing automation platforms that have all those tools integrated, you know, the, I think like the starter packages for those are, are like $800 a month we're talking. So like, and they go up from there. So they, they can be quite expensive for people. Um, and I, also there's some challenges with, with proprietary platforms where you don't necessarily own your experience, you own your data, it's your content and you can copyright that stuff, but you can't take that experience and take it somewhere else versus something like WordPress. You could start on wordpress.com and you could download it and then host it and grow it into something else that you would completely own that experience. Um, so yeah, it's kind of like, wh where do you draw those lines between like, how much do you want to manage yourself? Because I'm up with the mind, like, especially if your budget's tight, you don't want to manage all this stuff yourself, right? Like databases, firewalls, servers, all that stuff can be quite hard to manage. So where do you draw those lines? I don't know. I, that's why I like Jamstack. I feel like it's a way that you can own your technology stack and offload some of those things. But, you know, yeah. It's hard to say. I don't know, Rick. I, sorry, I didn't mean to, if you had thoughts on that. No, no. Do you, Rick, do you notice any issues with kind of like the headless approach? So I, I think headless was getting really popular, especially you know, in the Drupal community that we're both a part of, I think, you know, people saw this happening where, where reactive front ends uh, were becoming really popular and people wanted that, that real time type feedback. Um, and so Drupal seemed like it was positioning itself as more of an API backend to, to integrate with these things more and more these days. Um, do you notice any, in any client sites where you've done this or examples where you've seen this, do people have trouble with that division between the actual like place where you're editing your content and the place where you're displaying and viewing your content when, when they're set up that way. Cause you know, Drupal's like backend being over here on a different server on a different web URL and then your client front end being over here. Have you noticed any like challenges to doing that from, for non-technical people? Well, again, I haven't, I haven't built any production sites like this, but I have heard that it's an issue where like with Gatsby sites or whatever, you don't see, you don't preview the page before you publish it. Like in Drupal or something, you can preview the page before you yeah. publish it, um, or you can see a draft. But I think that's getting better. So it may be better now so that you actually can preview a Gatsby page built on a Drupal site or maybe built on a WordPress site. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that stuff is all getting better. But yeah, it definitely was, was a problem. Maybe it still is a problem. Is that what you meant? Yeah, yeah. Something I always was kind of running into in some apps I worked on that were doing that. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, another question I had just real quick here is, um, have you dabbled with any of the kind of database as a service um, projects similar to Firebase? There's a couple that come to mind, um, Supabase, Enhost. Uh, there's another one called Static Backend who actually we had the creator of that um, project on this meetup uh, a couple months back. Um, have you dabbled with any of those at all and how they compare to something like Firebase? That's something you've heard? No, no, honestly, Firebase is the only thing like that that I've used. And another thing I've never used is, you know, quote serverless functions for doing certain things. So yeah. that's a whole, that's a whole nother world I haven't gotten into. <laughs> yep. Where you, you can, my understanding is you can send off just one little function, you know, to do on some Amazon, serverless thing and it comes back with the answer um yeah it's like one of those things everybody's talking about but no one's no one's doing it <laughs> <laughs> it's like blockchain yeah exactly <laughs> exactly yeah. well um does anyone else have questions or comments 
Thank you. That was. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go back through the slides myself and th think about some of those things and and what and look at them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks for coming. Yeah. Thanks so much, Rick. This was great. I, okay. I feel like you covered so much ground in such a short period of time. Yeah. Probably too short. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. It's a good way to like get a preview of everything. There's so many of those products that I want to check out and I just haven't had time to like look at directly and seeing you do like the screen share of it. It was really helpful to see what the interface looks like, see what the workflow is. And then going over the critical connection pieces is super helpful. So thank you so much. Good, great. Yes, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. You're welcome, thank you. All right. Well, thanks so much everyone. I'm gonna stop the recording. Uh